Hi, I'm Lexi and this is Hannah and we're Wild About Conservation. This is the podcast where we explore the world of conservation through discussions with our very knowledgeable guests. This season's focus is on all things ocean. We had such an amazing conversation with Will, we decided to split his podcast in two. In today's episode, we talked to William Kay about his PhD, his internships and volunteer experience. Come back next week to learn more about monitoring the behaviour of seals. We learned so much chatting to Will today about his research and appreciated the chance to learn a little bit more about the seals in the UK. We hope you enjoy listening to this podcast. Please remember to leave us a review, get in touch on Twitter, and if you would like to support us as creators, we do have a Patreon. You can check out all of the links in the show notes on our website. Enjoy the episode. Hi, thank you for chatting to us today. So can you firstly introduce yourself to our listeners, who you are, your pronouns, what you do, and your key interest in conservation? Hi, and good morning. Uh, My name is William Kay. I'm a PhD student at Swansea University and also a research technician at Swansea University. And my pronouns are he, him. And what interested me in conservation, well, it all sort of started uh, just before university in 2010, when uh, the key sort of issue at the time in the marine environment was ocean acidification. And that was all over the news. It was a really hot topic. And it's something that really sparked my interest in uh, marine conservation and the oceans in general. And ever since then, I've been more and more aware of the sort of global challenges that we face, things like the biodiversity crisis, things like climate change, uh, and in particular, the marine environment is is a very fragile one uh, and something that we know very little about and so that's sort of always been my driving force behind my interest in conservation of the marine environment. That sounds excellent and I can't wait to get deep into the chat of you and your experiences today but before we do we do have a very short game that we like to play with our guests. It's a really fun quick fire round of a couple of questions to keep you on your toes and for us to get to know you a little bit as well. So, okay. if you could be any animal, what would it be? It would be a seal, for sure. That's very on brand. Um, <laughs> can you tell me something that you love that has nothing to do with conservation? Ooh, um, cycling. Absolutely fair. And finally, would you rather be a dung beetle a mayfly or a cockroach they're all really really cool things to be um Mm -hmm. it's between a dung beetle and a cockroach and i'm gonna go with my gut instinct and say dung beetle yep i feel that (laughs) (laughs) i like you preface that with they're really cool things to be because people are always like that's a really hard mean question (laughs) (laughs) i'd want to be all of them to be fair the cockroach because people hate them and it's just like you know, you know, it's amazing to be something that people are so disgusted by. You just run around and wind everyone up and the dung beetle is just a bit weird and wonderful. So, yeah. Yeah, they're certainly like a bit mysterious. Um, but yeah, finally, every episode before we dive deep into seals and everything you've been working on, we ask our guests, how do they get wild about conservation? So, well, how do you get wild? Gosh, well... I just love being outdoors and and just being able to appreciate how wacky and weird nature is. You know, every all of the species that we see just in our back gardens and, and flying around in the skies, they're all so unique and so impressive. And they've all, you know, evolved over millennia to be so excellent, have such excellent adaptations for what, you know, for, for what they do and, and for how they need to, to, to survive. And it's just... I, I, I sort of live my life by a, a quote by Richard Feynman, which is um, everything is interesting if you look into it deeply enough. And I think that that really is true. And, and you know, anything and everything can be interesting if you give it the time and, and have an open mind to, uh, to to look at it and study it and, and just think, yeah, this is really cool. Um, so I guess wild about conservation, I'm, I'm sort of I'm wild about anything and everything, really. You've just got to give it give it that time. That is a perfect quote, especially for a PhD student, because you have to get really, really into one topic. (laughs) And 
<laughs> whilst we're on that kind of area, can you tell us about your university career so far, what you're studying, how you got there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know, you know, I know the feels uh, for yourself, uh, Hannah, being a PhD student. I've just <laughs> did uh, my PhD, which was in uh, this, the movement ecology of uh, grey and harbour seals or seals in the UK. And it was investigating how these seals are using uh, very fast flowing tidal environments. And I'll probably uh, save a bit more about that for a bit later. And in terms of how I got to where I am today, it was quite a, a linear career, really. It wasn't particularly um, uh, special in, in so far as there, there weren't any big tangents. I went to uh, Swansea University to do a, a bachelor's in marine biology back in 2010. Um, I'd actually always wanted to be a vet when I was younger. Um, but as I sort of got into my teens and, and certainly as I, as I came towards university age, I was always fascinated in, in the oceans and fell in love with the oceans. Um, and so that inspired me, as, as I said, with the ocean acidification stuff to go into marine biology. I did a bachelor's degree in marine biology in Swansea University. And then after that, I worked for a boating company for the months between my um, bachelor's and my master's degree, which again was at Swansea University. And that was in animal movement science uh, with Professor Rory Wilson investigating harbour seal movements. And then I stayed at Swansea University again uh, for, <laughs> I'm part of the furniture now, for a PhD <laughs> which I started in 2016 and actually only just submitted uh, in 2020. So that was a long haul, but I did various other things along the way. So I've done a lot of volunteering, a lot of extracurricular activities with the British Ecological Society, but I've also done uh, things like a science policy internship with the Royal Society. So um, apart from a couple of divergent divergences here and there, it's been pretty, pretty linear from one, one academic uh, degree to the other. Uh, and, and I should actually say that that wasn't always the plan. Um, after the bachelor's degree, I really wanted to go into sort of conservation work or even um, working for a renewable energy company. But then uh, the opportunity came along to do a master's degree with Rory, which was just a really, really cool one uh, and something I was really interested in. So I decided to do that. And the stars sort of aligned. I got a couple of part time work opportunities to fund the degree. And then the same sort of thing happened at the end of the master's. I wanted to work for the marine renewable energy industry. I wanted to help the renewable energy industry to, to fight climate change. Um, but a, a super cool PhD came up, which was literally almost written for me. It was everything I was interested in. And so I just did the PhD. And so partly out of convenience, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting for other students or for other uh, people wanting to work in academia or conservation. I think you sort of have to... Um, just go with your gut instinct and take the opportunities that come to you. And, and you might want to do one thing, but if another fantastic opportunity presents itself, don't be afraid to just go with that one. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've not really moved away from Swansea uh, or, or from academia yet. Um, so, yeah, I've been in academia all my life, pretty much. I think you've picked up on some really key mm. things there that so many things can all happen at once and different opportunities and just the you might make a plan and your plan will go in a different direction. But yeah. just picking up what you just said about um, the British Ecological Society and also mm. the other internship you mentioned, could we dive into those a little bit deeper? What What were you doing? Yeah. What were you getting up to? Yeah, of course. Um, so the British Ecological Society, I've, I've done loads of things um, for them over the last sort of five years alongside my PhD. So that, that stuff really kicked off at the beginning of my PhD um, because of um, one of my supervisors, Luca Borger, who's particularly well associated with the BES, and he just encouraged me to do anything and everything with the BES. So those have, those things have involved um, most particularly things like uh, summer schools. So I've been a PhD mentor at uh, some of their summer schools, which involves a week-long residential um, school for undergraduates and some A-level students to learn anything and everything about ecology. Um, so I was a mentor at those schools and I would be not only providing pastoral care but also teaching some things on those schools so uh, things like statistics and analysis but also uh, policy making. So the, the British Ecological Society has been mainly those summer schools but also um, volunteering at conferences as uh, conference helpers and also chairing some sessions uh, on global challenges and opportunities outside of academia uh, as well. So I've had all sorts of weird and wonderful involvements with the BES uh, and, and anyone can, can get involved with them just have a look on their website follow their newsletter and there's so many different ways to get involved uh, at the end of my bachelor's degree I was very fortunate to be offered an opportunity to go out to Argentina with Rory 
uh, to work on penguins as part of my dissertation. And that involved some collaboration with Centro Nacional Patagonico, which is the National Research Center of Patagonia. So that was sort of a, a not so much an internship, but like a month long research placement. Um, af- after my bachelor's degree, I did a month with the National Trust for Scotland as a volunteer field assistant. So I went out to the Isle of Mingale, which is the uh, one of the southernmost isles of the uh, Outer Hebrides. And I did some seabird monitoring work for them. Um, so again, not 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 specifically an internship, but you could almost view it as an internship. It was it was an opportunity to to work for a, as a warden um, with the National Trust. Uh, you know the expenses were covered, but it was a voluntary post. Um, but that was that was a, a really amazing opportunity. I spent a month there on on Mingle, which is an uninhabited island. So it was just me and one other person for a month, very wow. remote. Um, <laughs> boats, uh, you know, you, you received all your food by um, by boat, sort of once a week rations. Uh, and if the weather was really bad, you had to spend a few more days. So you had to stretch your food and make it last for the days you couldn't get it delivered. So that was that was an awesome experience. Um, no, no sort of uh, internet, anything like that. You were completely disconnected. You had a satellite phone for emergencies, but other than that, you were. I remember writing letters home as like you know it's quite it's quite a um, authentic and, and novel experience to be writing handheld letters and uh, receive them once a week and send them once a week. It's really cool. And then most recently, the internship which I've done is a science policy internship, and that was with the Royal Society in London. That was a paid a paid placement for six months, and I took a, a sabbatical out from the PhD to do that. And that was um, really quite different. It was very refreshing. Uh, at that point, I was about a year and a half into my PhD, and I'd always been interested in policy, and, and particularly in the, in the last few years because of uh, Brexit most, most uh, pertinently. I was I was really interested in sort of the disconnect between academia and and public life and policy making in general and wanting to bridge that gap. Uh, and I've always wanted to sort of I've always been very interested in politics and and wanted wanting to be involved in making a difference in that regard. And so policy making internships are a fantastic way to do that. And uh, the reason I say it was refreshing is because I wasn't actually involved in any of their sort of marine biology work. I was involved in their data team which uh, investigates things like machine learning, uh, data governance, so things like the NHS, how they use your data uh, and the rules and restrictions around use of people's data uh, and cyber security. So it was actually completely out of my comfort zone um, and, a, and a real steep learning curve. But that was um, a phenomenal experience. And I was my, my sort of main duties, I suppose, were contributing to things like um, active consultations with, for the government writing reports um, for the government and also uh, bringing together uh, industry professionals and academics and government officials to have meetings at the Royal Society with their fellows. Uh, and I was I was actually very disappointed because in the time I was at the Royal Society, both Sir David Attenborough and Professor Stephen Hawking visited the building that I was working in and I didn't get to meet either of them. So I was oh, gutted. No. But yeah, Stephen Hawking was was there and I didn't even know he was there. And it was only afterwards when I left the building and I saw he had a, um, a special vehicle which allowed him to tr- drive his wheelchair into the back of the vehicle. And I sort of looked at this vehicle and thought, oh, I wonder what that's for. And, and just walked out, walked, ho- walked home uh, and then later found out that it was Stephen Hawking's vehicle. And had I sort of lingered for about another five, ten minutes, I may have even met him. So oh my. <laughs> I was, uh, <laughs> such a shame. But there we are. He's one of my my heroes, Stephen Hawking, and, and obviously David Attenborough. How can how can David Attenborough not be? Um, so yes, yeah, so, some some really weird um, and and different uh, policy internships and di- various internships at the BES. And again, all of these things people can get involved in. You know, check out the vacancies on the Royal Society webpage and follow things like um, the British Ecological Society newsletter or the Royal Society of Biology newsletter. And there's a huge number of of internships that can be. Uh, undertaken and and many of them are actually paid i know there's a lot of discussion uh particularly in the marine mammal community at the moment about unpaid internships and the you know the fact that most people that want to do these things simply can't afford to do them uh, and that is that is definitely true but i think if you look hard enough and, and you're persistent you will find some opportunities that are paid and uh, and yeah go for a, as many of them as you can if you have time to do them all that sounds wonderful. I can't believe how much experience you've managed to get alongside your university career. But yeah. on top of all of that, I know you volunteer for a couple of charities. So would you like to talk us through some of those other opportunities that you've been involved with? Yeah. During my undergraduate degree, most of the volunteering I did was with 
the student university um, Sabaqua Club. So mm-hmm. I'm a, a full, fully qualified uh, scuba diving instructor. I'm also a power boating instructor. Um, and so I was teaching students. In fact, Lexi, I taught you, of course, a, a few mm-hmm. bits of what, um, of scuba diving over the years. And uh, alongside that, I founded the Marine Biology Society at the university. Most of the, um, the degree schemes have uh, an associated society. And I must say it's with a heavy heart that uh, the society seems to have sort of disbanded since the time I founded it. So it was active for maybe a couple of years and then I ran out of time and, and, and a bit of steam and, and due to other commitments, wasn't able to keep keep it going. And I think it sort of just fell a bit by the wayside. So I'm, I'm as I'm still at Swansea University, I'm working to try and uh, get that back and up and running so that students have a, another opportunity to, to get involved with things. So most of it, most of my volunteering work um, in my earlier years was with student clubs, but I also did a fair bit with the Marine Conservation Society, the MCS, as a sea champion. And, and a lot of that was uh, doing things like cetacean monitoring. And so going out on boats and looking for cetaceans and doing uh, counts of whales and dolphins that occur around the south coast of Swansea. Um, but then a lot of litter picks as well, organising events to do uh, beach litter picks and just general awareness, really, things like plastic pollution and trying to encourage members of the public not to um, use so much plastic or certainly not to just chuck it all in landfill but try and recycle most of it. More recently my volunteering work has, has sort of been with um, the British Divers Marine Life Rescue and also the Welsh Marine Life Rescue which are two organisations that rescue uh, cetaceans and, and, and seals uh, around the Welsh and well the UK coasts. Things like seals that have been abandoned by their mothers a bit too soon and haven't been able to fen- uh, forage well for themselves or cetaceans that are stranded, uh, have got lost, um, or have been affected by things like military sonar and are, um, are strand, strand themselves on the beaches and need to be rescued back into the sea or unfortunately taken away for post-mortem. So we've done a couple of post-mortems now at Swansea University of harbour porpoises and the like. Uh, and of course, as, as sad as it is, um, it's, it's a great uh, opportunity to learn about what affects these animals and, and what we can do to mitigate uh, those potential events in the future. Um, in addition to that, not really marine biology related, but I'm a volunteer for the uh, RNLI, for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. I'm a, a lifeboat crew member in my spare time, so I'm on call. Uh, I've turned the pager off. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know for this conversation. <laughs> I've told them I'm not available for a couple of hours, uh, but normally I'd be um, responding around the clock. So we get you know shouts as they as they're called, and we have to go and rescue people out at sea. So that and, and I love that. It's one of the one of my you know, I've always wanted to be on the crew and it's such a, a wonderful opportunity to be able to do that as well. There's so many different things that you're up to and just picking up on some of the things that you've said is all of these different transferable skills that you've got from all these different experiences, be it running and working with a society or doing the internships that you've done during your PhD. Because I don't think a lot of PhD students realise that those opportunities are out there until they start a PhD. Um and that it really is your own journey that you shape when you're doing a PhD and taking these internships is a great opportunity. And yeah, I just think it's great that you're, <laughs> you have so many of these different skills. Um, one of the questions I actually wanted to ask before we uh, jump into maybe where you're going next is you've done your internship um, on policy and obviously that was engaging with the data team, as you said, and governance of data, which in itself, how we handle people's data is a really important research and development or just general um, worker development skill. Could you, and it's okay if not, (laughs) kind of give us a feeling of how people could get more savvy about policy and how policy is formed? Because this is a conversation that comes up a lot and people saying that things are relevant to policy or that they want to try and help change policy, but not a lot of people know what those kind of terms actually mean or how they can go about bringing about an action yeah absolutely it's a a great question um one before i answer that one of the things just to pick up on what you've what you've asked about um sort of transferable skills i must thank uh dr andrew king from swansea university he was the postgraduate officer at the time when i started my phd excuse me and i remember a discussion i had with him right at the beginning of the phd and he said well you'll have loads of opportunities that present themselves to you during this degree. And while you must make sure to ban it, you know, balance your time, try to take as many of those opportunities as possible. And, I, and, and that conversation, I probably didn't put it as eloquently as he did, but that conversation really stuck with me. And I, and I 
tried my best to live by that alongside the PhD. And it, admittedly, it probably meant that my PhD took a few more years than I would have liked it to. But I definitely think I, I earned uh, a lot of great skills from that. And, and I would strongly recommend others do the same. Um, so yeah, on the policy stuff, it's definitely one of these things that it feels a bit sort of disconnected for most people. It's not a very tangible subject. Um, policy itself is is a bit of a horrible buzzword because people get confused by it, but it's actually very simple. Policy is just uh, a statement that you're going to do something. So when political parties publish their manifestos, that is just a book full of policies. It's just a book, a list of things that I'm going to do. That's all a policy is. And so policy making is just saying you're going to do something and then finding ways and action actioning that to make sure it's done. And as individuals, we can quite easily actually get involved in, in policy making by uh, writing to your MP or just speaking to your MP. And of course, at the moment with COVID, uh, we don't have much opportun opportunity to do that. But before COVID, I was uh, meeting with my MP in person as often as I could, talking to her about uh, Brexit, talking to her about various conservation issues. Um, and, you know, I found that it might not be the case with all MPs, but my MP in particular was extremely receptive. And, you know, the more pressure you put on your MPs, and, and that can just be simply the weight of letters that are written to them, the, the more they have to do something about it. You know, they, they are there to represent their constituents. And, uh, you know, if they don't represent their constituents well, then it's very likely that they won't be voted in in the next election. So they're, they're, they are obliged to, to do something about what you ask them to to do and also simply to respond to your letters if you write a letter to an mp they are obliged to respond and so they have to take some time out of their day to respond to that um so you know the issue will then be at the forefront of their mind so that's that's one way another way is i guess as an academic and as students is um as i mentioned things like the bes and the royal society of biology uh, newsletters they will list open consultations so the government's the way the, one of the key drivers for uh, government policy is these things called open consultations and that's where the government asks everyone and anyone in the uk and potentially further afield for some expert advice or some opinions on different subjects so that could be i mean one of the big ones i remember is ocean acidification uh, and people like uh, plymouth oceanographic institute wrote into them i remember reading a big uh, report from the from the plymouth oceanographic institution to written for this open consultation but if you look at these if you if you follow these newsletters and you look at some of these consultations that are, that are ongoing and there's always consultations that are open right now there's a lot of uh, open consultations on the badger tuberculosis transmission um, and I know people like the professor Rosie Woodroff at the Zo Zoological Society of London she leads a lot of the responses to to those but if you see a consultation that is relevant to your area of expertise um, or even just relevant to your own interests that you know an academic in your institution is interested in, then, you know, why not approach your academic and say, look, we could put a two page letter together for this consultation and you can contribute to things in that way. Those, I'd say, are the, the two easiest ways um, to do it. There are other ways, but they tend to be a little bit more disconnected. So you could give evidence to um, select committees um, that you tend to need far greater expertise to, to be invited to do that. But actually, there's um, funnily enough, I've, I've put together since uh, doing this policy internship, I've put together a, um, a sort of one or two hour long workshop called Policy Making for Ecologists. And I'd be happy to um, share more about that with you. I mean, I could talk for the whole two hours on on this. So I, I best not, because I know you have a lot more to ask me. But if um, you know, if you wanted more resources, then uh, I'd be I'd be more than happy to share those and, and maybe give you know, I can share I've written a couple of blogs about policy making as well. So I could share those with your listeners. Um, and, and, you, and they can find out so much more as well. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right in the sense that it is this scary buzzword. And I didn't fully understand what policy entirely was until I started working with and for volunteers and had to write my first volunteer policy and all of the other documents that go mm. along with that. And I was like, oh, this is literally <laughs> just a situation of so that they know what we do, we know what they do, and it outlines everything. So it's all just written down and it's really clear yeah. for everybody to get involved. But you're right. And I think the way you explained that was really, really nice and really accessible and thank you for giving some actual examples of how people can get involved should they want to within their own areas but yeah before we go on to a couple of definitions and your actual topic of what you're here to chat about um 
I wanted to ask, seeing as you just said you'd submitted your PhD, have you got any plans for after? That's a horrible question, I know. Well, I'm I'm currently full time employed at Swansea University, so I've taken a bit of a, a sidestep, but one that I'm uh, absolutely committed to. So I did all my all my research on seals, but I'm now actually working for the Seagrass Ocean Rescue Project, which is a um, the UK's largest seagrass restoration project, uh, and it's teamed up with the World Wildlife Fund and Team uh, Sky, and also. Um, Project Seagrass, which is the charity arm of this uh, Seagrass Ocean Rescue Project. So the plan was and is to build on uh, the restoration of two hectares of seagrass meadows in uh, Dale, Pembrokeshire in Wales. Mm -hmm. And we've done that now. We've actually planted over a million seeds in Dale. And I was uh, sort of, I'm I'm one of the technicians. uh, So I work full time for that project now as one of the technicians. And I'm a commercial skipper. So I um, drive the vessels to uh, to make sure that when we plant the seeds, we plant them by by vessel from from a boat. So I'm the one usually driving the boat uh, and and contributing in all sorts of other ways. I did some uh, grant development work with them before before my technician role. So uh, yeah, after the PhD, I'm pretty much already committed. <laughs> I'm, I'm fortunate in that I have full time employment already. But I, I I definitely very much want to keep my finger in the sort of movement ecology pie. Um, and I'm, you know, in, in all the time I can find, I'm writing uh, my chapters up as manuscripts and getting those submitted for publication. Um, my Viva examination, which is the defence of my thesis, is actually on the 29th of March. So I've got a few weeks before having to defend uh, my thesis. So I'm preparing for that. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got all sorts of things uh, I'm, I'm doing. But um, the restoration project is, is I've, I've my contract has just been extended for about another 15 months. So I'm, I'll be working for them for the foreseeable future. Oh, that's excellent news. Nice to have a little bit of job security. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's it. It's, um, you know, I was, fur- I wasn't furloughed actually, I should say. So in last year when the lockdown sort of came into force in the first wave, I lost about three or four months of income. So that was really quite brutal for me. And since then I've been lucky to actually keep my job and, um, and have that extended. So yeah, fortunately I've got some job security, which is a blessing for, for most academics. But I think that's not only, it's, it's luck of course. And like we've been saying throughout your career so far it is a little bit of luck and the stars do have to align to some sense of things, yeah. but I think you need to take, take a moment and take stock because you have said yes, and you have sought out these opportunities and you have worked really hard so yeah, far. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's a little bit of luck, but a lot of hard work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You do make your own opportunities. And, and you know, with the last couple of, of jobs that I've had, um, before the seagrass work, I worked for SeaCams 2, which is another big project at Swansea University. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very long acronym, so I won't, um, I won't say it, but have a look at SeaCams on, online. And I was working for them to do cetacean monitoring. And I was for both employments, I was actually approached by the employer because I have a commercial skipper's license. Uh, and so, you know, as much as uh, it was lucky, it was also because I have done the, the, the power boating and I've, I've trained myself up. I've upskilled myself to to have these qualifications that people now know, oh, you know, Will's got that. He he would be useful to us. So people come to me now, which is really nice. Um, <laughs> rather than having to seek out work, people tend to come to me to ask me to do stuff for them. That's pretty cool. I'm, uh, yeah, sorry, Will, when you said then about Project Seagrass, I suddenly realised we are a lot closer in connections than I'd first realised, um, oh, right. as cool. I also work with Richard Lilly from Project Seagrass. Up well, here Richard Lilly, RJ, is one of my closest friends. I've known him since 2013, 2014, I think. So he actually did his master's degree while I was finishing off my undergraduate. So yeah, we, we go back years, at least right. six years. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that shows the marine world, especially in the UK, and anything I think that links between um, the different parts of the UK is very, very small. But before we end up down an absolute <laughs> meadow of a seagrass, um, what is a seal? What is a seal? We work very on quick. seals, so we're going to completely sideline and go deep dive into what you've been doing for the past four years now. So what is a seal? Okay, so a seal, it's actually, um, the proper name for a seal is a pinniped. And pinniped is, a, is a, an order of, of mammal, marine mammals which makes up three sub sort of uh, clades. And they are uh, the odobenids, which are the, the walruses, the otterids, which are the eared seals. So they comprise the fur seals and the sea lions and the phocids, which are the earless seals or the true seals. Uh, and I, my work has always been on phocids, so earless or true, true seals. Uh, they are a, um, a carnivore. They're fin-footed. They're a semi-aquatic 
marine mammals. So they spend time on land uh, and at sea. Um, so yeah, that's uh, their closest relative. If, if anyone wanted to know a bears, that's cool. Yeah, sea bears. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of people call them the sea dogs, but actually, they're probably better off described as sea bears. So when did you see your first ever seal? Uh, my first seal, I honestly couldn't couldn't remember. Um, probably very young, sometime at a zoo. I imagine somewhere like North Wales. Um, there's a Welsh Mountain Zoo in North Wales. I, I imagine it was probably there. I know that my first wild seal was um, at, a, at a little cove called Angel Bay, uh, close to my house in or my family home, I should say, in North Wales, when I was about probably around eight or nine years old. As, yeah, Angel Bay, I think if anyone listening lives in North Wales and isn't aware of Angel Bay, that is a beautiful place to go. Um, but obviously still be quiet if there are seals there. And sure. I know when I see, I've seen hundreds of porpoise over the years, um, again, in North Wales, when I used to live there. Do you still get excited with every seal that you see? Because I can imagine you've seen quite a lot of seals. Yeah, I do. I, I have seen uh, uh, probably thousands of seals, if not tens of thousands. Um, but I do still get really excited when I see them because they're just such formidable animals. You know, I think a lot of people think seal and they think cute, fluffy, especially the youngsters, you know, when they're, when they're born, they've got this really um, cute brownish white down, um, co- you know, Lanugo um, fur coat, and they are adorable. Um, but actually the side of, of seals that people don't tend to know so much are that they're really formidable animals. You know, in, in the UK, the grey seal has no predators. It is the top of its um, food chain. Uh, except for humans, I guess. But, you know, I'm sort of discounting humans for the time being. In terms of predators in the marine environment, seals are, uh, you know, the top of the food chain. And they're they're also cannibalistic. They'll eat um, young of their own. And they also uh, forage on um, other marine mammals. So grey seals will actually kill and eat harbour seals. And they'll also kill and eat harbour porpoise. Um, And they're just such awesome creatures you know they're huge they grow up to like 300 kilos um the gray seal at least the harbor seal is quite a bit smaller but still quite an impressive size at about 100 100 140 kilos and there's still so much to learn about them um and i think every time i watch a seal i learn something new or i see something different so you know they they're, they're generalist and opportunistic predators so they tend to eat a bit of anything and everything they're, most of their diet comprises fish and uh, marine invertebrates or crustaceans. But I've seen seals eating cuttlefish. I've seen them eating octopus. And if you've ever scuba dived and seen a cuttlefish or an octopus moving on the water, or even just watched videos of an octopus, it, they're just, you know, how a seal, you think this large animal, when you see them on the water, they're so, uh, on the land, sorry, they're so cumbersome. But when they're in water, they're just so elegant and so fast moving and so agile and they completely dominate you uh, you know i've dived with seals and they just run run circles around you um so they're, they're awesome animals they're really cool to watch and they're just um every every time i see them i think what what more can i learn it was actually only last year um this is a very <laughs> touchy subject let's say but last year it was the first time i saw a seal penis i watched <laughs> seals mating and i'd never seen a seal's penis before and i was like oh that's really interesting like i've never I've never actually seen that before in all the time I've studied seals. So that was really cool to see. Um, so, yeah, anytime I see a seal, I'm excited because I think, what, what am I going to see this time? They're, they're quite unpredictable. I think that's an excellent point. And I think any sort of animal behaviour traits that we know about from watching documentaries is really nice to see. But then, mm. like you say, when you see them do just silly things, you're just like, cool, these are just other animals with other personalities. Whereas I think we only yeah. really consider animals in captivity or our own pets to have personalities um so it's nice to hear you say that um but yeah before we go go too deep into like an individual seal behavior (laughs) or anything (laughs) like that can you tell me how many species of seal are there and how many species do we have in the uk so there are 33 extant species of seal so ones living today Mm -hmm. there are there are 50 that are extinct so we've lost a lot more over the years, but I guess a lot of that is down to um, just, you know, many of them died many, many millions or thousands of millions of years ago. Uh, so, yeah, 33 at the moment. Only two of those live uh, resident in the UK, but you can occasionally see a couple of odd visitors. So I remember in uh, 2018, just a few years ago, uh, there was an Arctic walrus sighted in Scotland on the Western Isles. 
and there was also a bearded seal in the Shetland Isles, so the north the north um, group of islands in, in Scotland. So, um, yeah, you, you do tend to see a couple of uh, curious and odd visitors that are rare to the UK. In terms of resident seals, they are the grey seal, Haliquirus gripus, and the uh, harbour seal or the common seal, which is Phoca vitulina. Amazing. And how many seals do we actually have here? So this is this is one of the facts that I think is most important for your listeners to know uh, and to realise that actually the UK is a huge uh, um, home for for seals, uh, for the grey and the harbour seals. So grey seals, the UK has over a third of the world's population of grey seals. It has about 38 percent of the world's population. And there's about um, on average, it depends on on, on the methods of counting and it depends obviously year to year. But generally speaking, there's about 150,000 grey seals in the UK at any time. Um, And that's out of a population of about 400,000 worldwide population is this sort of minimum estimate. It can go, estimates can go up quite quite a bit more than that. But most often than not, uh, seals, grey seals are cited at being about 38% in the UK. So, you know, they're they're really common. And and, and that means that the UK has a has a responsibility to protect those species. And as a, um, as a member of the public, and, uh, you know, you have a responsibility as well to make sure that these species, which we we are, you know, our islands are home to, are protected and, and, and well looked after. In terms of the harbour seal, we have, I mean, the worldwide population is about 350,000, somewhere between 350 to 500,000. And the UK has about 46,000 of those. So a bit less. Um, most of those are in uh, Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, so not so many, but still, you know, not, not, not an insignificant number either. You just mentioned about estimating the population size of that many seals. Um, Mm. How do ecologists actually go about getting those kind of numbers and tracking populations from year to year? Yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult, but there are a few ways. Probably the most useful one is aerial surveys. So they'll fly over, um, you know, these really dense haul out sites where the where the pups are being born and they tend to they tend to actually estimate population size based on the number of pups so the number of pups if you multiply that number by about it's somewhere between three and 4.5 uh, they that gives you a rough estimate of how many uh, seals there are worldwide yeah so aerial surveys but aerial surveys of course don't tell you much about some of the seals that haul out in caves and particularly in places in wales there are an awful lot of seals that haul out in caves so in terms of um, grey seals, which is really my speciality, harbour seals less so, but grey seals in particular, in the southwest of Wales, the, the population is about 5,000 around Pembrokeshire. And that is the largest population or largest group of individuals in all of the south of the UK. Most of the grey seals in the UK are actually in Scotland. Excuse me, and we, but we have a, a very large uh, number in, in Wales as well. And for those animals that tend to haul out in caves, it's much more difficult. Obviously, you can't see them necessarily with an aerial survey, even with drones. You, people are using drones now and uh, you have to fly them quite precariously towards these caves in order to actually count the seals. So some of the some of the cave dwelling seals have to just be estimated or have to be, um, you know, you drive around the islands with a boat and, and see if you can count uh, which, which animals are in the caves. Um, those, those would be the, the main ways of doing it. There's obviously land based surveys as well. So if you want to get a good population count, you have to really use a, a various different, all of these different methods and combine the numbers um, to, to, to make sure you, you're covering all the potentials. In terms of tracking them, um, you know, in terms of tracking the population size, you can use things like photo, uh, photo ID. So uh, seals have unique uh, pelage patterns. They have unique unique spot patterns, which do change at some point over the life history. I'll, I'll tell you a bit more. A bit, bit more about that in a minute, but you can use photos to track individuals, and you can uh, also mark them with with little tags, um, so rings like you would tag a, a cattle uh, with an ear tag. You can tag uh, seals with flipper tags with have individual ID numbers, and you use those tags in like a mark recapture study to see where they go and to make sure you're not estimating uh, one seal in one location and then the seal moves and you recount it in another location. So you mentioned some massive numbers there of different species of seals especially those around the UK so Mm. what is their current status? Seals in the UK are doing really well actually um mostly mostly um I should I should add 
grey seals tend to be increasing in, in pretty much all of their areas, and particularly in Wales. Some of the research that's come out from Swansea University, my supervisors, um, Dr. Jimble and uh, Professor Luca Borger, have published recently, show that the number of, of, of seals in, in Wales, particularly grey seals, are increasing. And the same pretty much can be said for the harbour seals. The UK population as a whole is increasing, but there have been some uh, substantial declines in Scotland on the Scottish east coast. Um, and the the reasons for that are not completely understood. Uh, it's obviously something we need to be uh, concerned about. And there is a, a very big uh, project ongoing led by the Sea Mammal Research Unit in St Andrews called the Harbour Seal Decline Project. And that's trying to, 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 to learn you know, and work out what is actually causing such big declines. The, the, some of the reasons why these, think these, these animals could be declining are um, on the east coast of Scotland, you've obviously got neighbouring waters are uh, the North Sea and then the Wadden Sea, which is the coast of Denmark and Germany. And what we've seen in recent years is that the number of grey seals have been increasing in those areas and they can swim across the North Sea and they can uh, mix, the populations can mix. And grey seals, as I mentioned earlier, do actually kill and eat harbour seals, and they are a, a key competitor. So not only will harbour seal numbers decline through direct predation from grey seals, but harbour seal numbers will also decline because the grey seals are better predators. They're, they're quicker, uh, they, they, they're bigger animals, so they tend to be able to hold their breath for a bit longer. It means they can dive longer and deeper, and they can probably access uh, food sources that that harbour seals aren't able to, or they will, they will actually, um, you know, encourage harbour seals to move away from good foraging grounds because they would attack the harbour seal. So there's there's direct predation from a growing number of grey seals, um, but there's also things like uh, changes in prey quality and prey availability with climate change. You know, the temperature of the waters are changing, and that moves, uh, you know, prey species away from areas that they might they might have previously inhabited. And there's also, um, you know, ever-growing numbers of pollutants and toxins in the water that can make um, uh, seals more susceptible to, to other illnesses. We fortunately haven't had uh, a recent outbreak of what's called the Focine Distemper virus, the PDV, which was a big virus that had a, there was a big outbreak in 1988 and also in 2002 it killed very large numbers of seals. Um, we haven't had one of those, touch wood, for many years, but who knows with, uh, you know, there's so many um, zoonotic diseases you know, COVID being one of them, uh, and there's there's various other there's cases of bird flu in Russia. There's cases of uh, not a zoonotic disease per se, but bacterial infection, uh, salmonella poisoning from poultry farms in Poland. You know, there's all these um, threats to human and, and animal transmitted viruses, and and uh, there's always the risk that another um, focusing distemper virus might come back and, and, and kill large numbers. So that's something to be to bear in mind. But at the moment, generally speaking, uh, and at least in the UK, populations are doing well. In, in some areas, they're at the high, highest they've ever been, or at least approaching um, that, that level. So we, we shouldn't be too concerned, but we should always keep in the back of our minds that there are things that are threatening these animals. It's quite a broad spectrum of different threats there. And mm. obviously, you could end up with them interacting with each other with these changes in populations, changing as in sea temperatures, changes in foraging grounds. And I can imagine that having potentially, if it starts combining bigger impacts than what we're currently seeing. So the kind mm. of work that people are doing to really identify these pressures is so important. Mm. In terms of the seals themselves, obviously you've mentioned they are top predators. What yeah. does that mean for UK marine habitats? Why, why are yeah. our seals so important? Yeah, they're, so they're a top predator, but they are uh, what we call a top-down ecosystem control predator. So they are responsible for, obviously, foraging on fish. And uh, if you take away the, the top apex predators from a marine, marine environment, then that will you know, potentially really upset the balance of the marine environment. And you would have this surge in the number of fish. They would eat all the lower trophic level species. And then eventually they would sort of eat out everything that they they need to survive and so you sort of need those top-down control predators um, to to buffer the number of and to maintain the number of um, fish that are that are there of course fish species fish stocks in general are you know have been decimated by the fishing industry so and there's a lot of conflict between uh, fishing uh, salmon farm fisheries and and seals because seals love salmon and salmon fisheries are a very easy source of food for, for seals um, but generally speaking, in the natural environment, they, they serve a good role um, in terms of keeping the numbers of fish down or not out of control. 
Uh, they are also what's known as a, a biological indicator species or a marine sentinel, which means that, you know, seals are um, the top of the food chain. So any any issues in the food chain will be uh, borne out by by what we see in seals. So um, in, in other areas of the world, places like Japan, where there's very high levels of mercury poisoning, we see um, mercury loads building up in things like dolphins uh, and and sadly they they you know the, the dolphins that are killed in japan for dolphin fin soup we actually see that the mercury levels in the fins are passed on to the humans that eat them so um you know it, it all follows up the food chain and and the, the seals are so important because if you if something starts happening to the seals then that is indicative of something that might be happening more pervasively amongst the rest of the environment. Um, so things like responses to climate change, responses to pollution, um, seals are a great sort of first port of call um, to observe any anything negative that might be happening in, in the environment. So they're really useful. They're useful indicator species in that respect. Yeah, and I think that kind of links nicely back to why we do postmortems on animals when we find them stranded and when we can't yeah. help them. Um, they can be very, very good scientific indicators. Absolutely. But yeah, so we said that there's loads of seals in the UK and we've got a great opportunity, opportunity to see them around our coasts. So what should people do if they see a seal? Yeah, so that's a, a really good question, a very important question. Uh, if people see a seal, the most important thing to do is just to keep a good distance, really. Um, you know, it doesn't. if you can, try and stay downwind. Uh, try, you know, the seals have a very good sense, sense of smell, so don't let them smell you if at all possible, because that might um, set them a bit on edge. Uh, you know, when seals are on the land, although they're very large, formidable animals, they tend to be very skittish uh, because they are actually very vulnerable. You know, they're very sluggish and very cumbersome on land and they don't like to be uh, disturbed on land. They will, you know, make a rush for the for the water because they're so much better, so much more capable in the water. So um, try and keep a good distance. Certainly don't approach them. If you have dogs, make sure to keep them on leads because um, not only will the dogs disturb the seals, but if the seals bite the dogs, they will give them a really nasty bite. Um, seals have a, um, a virus called seal finger, which is a, a zoonotic disease. It can transfer between humans and seals. It can transfer between other animals. And it's a really nasty um, virus, something that you sort of need a very broad spectrum antibiotics to, to fix. And you certainly wouldn't want your dog getting bitten you wouldn't want uh, any young kids going anywhere near seals because they're so unpredictable. They might look very cute or fluffy, but um, even the, the youngsters can give you a really nasty nip. In fact, in, in, in the work I've done catching and, and tagging seals with, with animal tracking devices, the youngsters are always the ones you've got to be most careful of because uh, they're much more flexible and they will just like spin their head around almost like an owl and just bite you. So you've got to be really wary of the youngsters. Uh, obviously, don't feed them anything. They don't need to be fed anything. They get all their food from the marine environment. Um, and with the pups in particular, you know, there's a there's a sort of a um, every year the RSPCA and, and various other organisations have to put out a message to the general public to make sure that you're not disturbing the youngsters. Um, and it is very tempting to get a selfie with a seal or to you know uh, to just get a bit too close. But the problem is, if you disturb a youngster, at the very worst, if you touch a youngster and your scent gets on the youngster, then the mother will smell that and the mother will be um, far less inclined to come up to the beach and wean her pup um, and, and could actually decide to just abandon the pup altogether um, much sooner than the pup um, should be abandoned. And that's why we have all these other rescue organisations that go out sometimes um, rescuing these pups because they just haven't weaned for long enough. Um, and, and 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 a lot of the times people do that it's out of good it's out of a you know a place of kindness they think the pup needs to be in the water because well seals especially seals should be in the water but actually when they're born they're born with this um lanugo coat the white coat and they don't have much blubber and so they're actually really uh, susceptible to hypothermia and to getting too cold and they shouldn't be swimming, um, not least grey seals, um, when they're pups. They tend to be born and then weaned from their mothers for about three weeks. And in that time, they very rarely enter the water. They only tend to enter the water in certain areas where the tide um, is very high and it sort of they end up finding themselves caught out by the tide and they just end up swimming. So they can go in the water, but they're much better off uh, out of the water in those first few weeks. Once they've weaned after about 21 days, uh, the mother will abandon them and they can stay on the land for up to another 40 days before they decide to uh, to go off. Sometimes they enter the water and they disperse very quickly, but um, usually they tend to spend a, a bit of time uh, sort of lingering about on the beach. And, and 
I think the reason for that is that they're, they're there's some evidence from physiological research that they're preparing their bodies for um, some diving behavior. They, they, they're sort of adapting, uh, making sure their bodies are ready for what they need to do next. But also um, sometimes they just don't really know what to do. You know, they've been weaned off their mother for all these weeks and they're still only three weeks old, bless them. And sometimes they just don't know if they should be going off to sea yet or what should they, what they should be doing. So um, they might linger for a little while, but usually if you see a pup on the beach, if you're at all concerned, you can give someone like the British Divers Marine Life Rescue a ring um, they've got a, a, a hotline number that you can call and they tend to ask for you to send a picture. Um, I've rescued a few seals in my time that are clearly malnourished and, and underweight. Um, but until you sort of get your eye in and you've got that level of expertise, it's always quite tricky to know if a seal should be on the beach or um, if it should be in the water. But I'd say nine times out of 10, it's probably fine. Uh, you know, when you see a seal on the beach, it's usually fine. So try not to, uh, well, certainly don't encourage it in the water. Don't get too near to it. When they're in the water, um, if you dive or if you snorkel or if you're in a boat, uh, the best advice really is to just let them do what they want to do. If they want to come up to you and, uh, you know, in, they're very inquisitive. So if they want to come up and interact with you, then then they will and you can let them. Um, but certainly don't be approaching them. Uh, and there are, you know, certain times of the year where this is really crucial um, in the breeding season, sort of just after they uh, after pups have been born, which is in August, September time, immediately after that, the uh, the mothers uh, go into heat and the um, the males want to breed. And the males will very aggressively defend what's called a harem. The males have, uh, it's a single male to, to many, many females. And the males will be yeah, very aggressive and they'll defend their harem. So in, in those sort of months, months after September up to about December time, you definitely don't want to be approaching uh, males either on the land or in the water because they will um, be aggressive. So, yeah, the best advice is just to watch them from a distance. And I think everything you've just said there about having respect for these animals, I actually have yet to have the chance to ever swim with a seal. I've seen hundreds of seals, but I didn't know too much about seal finger till quite recently. Yeah, it's a nasty disease. And I know that you tend to have to get very broad spectrum antibiotics. And if you don't get those antibiotics quickly, it can be fatal. Um, uh, and and it, yeah, it's a horrible disease. And it's, it's one that you definitely don't want to catch. <laughs> Even if it has short or long lasting implications, the best best thing is just don't get it. Yeah, no matter what, just respect the seals. Stay, yeah, exactly. keep your distance. <laughs> yeah, they're great places around the UK to see seals, like you said, Angel Bay. There's also Donna Nook yeah. on the east coast of, of England. So, yeah. yeah. The Wash as well is a great place, particularly for harbour seals. The Wash in Norfolk uh, is a really, really good spot for harbour seals. But I mean, yeah, you, you'd be, you'd be hard pushed to find a, a spot of, uh, of the UK coastline where you couldn't see a seal, I'd say. Yeah, and I think that message kind of should be considered in terms of like what to do when you see a seal should be considered for all wildlife just respect yeah. respect it and if you're worried about it phone the right people i yeah. think generally if if i come across anything that i'm worried about i have a series of numbers in my phone because i am not equipped nor am i knowledgeable enough to start helping yeah. wildlife in the middle of a walk or in the middle of a, a beach cleaning or anything so i think that's a really important message just to double back on Thank you for listening today. As always, we have been Wild About Conservation and you have been awesome. Please do leave us a review. We would really appreciate it and we do read them all. To keep exploring with us, drop us an email or find us on our socials. All the links are in our description and the show notes. If you enjoy our show and want to support us, we are also on Patreon. Just £1 a month, 25p an episode, will cover our creation costs. And anything above that, we donate to charity. Thank you to those of you that are already helping us to keep creating. Our chosen charity for this season are the British Divers Marine Life Rescue, who are an organisation dedicated to the rescue and well-being of all marine animals in distress around the UK. Donations will go to training teams of volunteers and maintaining specialised equipment that is vital for their work. Don't forget to look out for our next episode next Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. If we aren't there, do let us know. And remember, step outside and get wild about conservation. Bye. Bye! How do you get wild? Watching wildlife documentaries. Wildflower painting. Diving. Wild swimming. Ocean watching. Rock climbing. Bird watching. Listening to podcasts. Hill walks. Visiting a wildlife charity.